Okay, so here we are again. Um, I'm gonna try Hello. Okay. So yes. Okay. So you joined and you should be able to ask for a request to join Sustainable Angle. Can we try that? Because that was super smooth before. Seems to be something funny. Okay, so I see the problem. Um, okay, so it says the Sustainable Angle must upgrade the app in order to join. So that seems to be the problem. So can we go with uh, Amanda's um, account just to get this going? So I'm going to try to request her. Well, certainly something I didn't expect, uh, but it's life and it's live. <laughs> okay, so I'm not able to join from this end. Oh, there we go. Okay. Something is happening. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, hallelujah. My goodness. Oh my goodness. That's I'm so sorry. sorry. <laughs> it's it's probably completely my hello everybody. Um hello. it's probably completely my fault, but I've got Claire's phone. So that's okay. good. Okay, Hi. never mind. We we are connected, so that's we're here now. Phone. We're here now. <laughs> Hello, good morning, Amanda. How good are you? Good morning. This. <laughs> I'm good. I'm also multitasking. I hope everybody else out there is good too. But it's really lovely to see you the same here and very very excited to have you on board for our uh, quick chat on materials because we like to bring the best people that we know <laughs> and actually what was really beautiful we were just chatting with Genia from being London and uh, we were asking uh -huh. her how do you source your amazing fabrics and she just said well the sustainable angle that's the best place to start <laughs> so here we are it's a nice little connection oh that's <laughs> a lovely forward. segue how how lovely that's so nice so let's get into it um, so we don't take too much of your time as well, because I know you guys are busy. You are in a studio or somewhere. I know you are doing a lot of things. So as, as usual, which is very exciting, um, and I'm glad you are busy. Um, so what I would like to do, because we get a lot of questions on materials and from, you know, from designers, but also from people, consumers, you know, and, and there is still such a confusion around materials and understanding how they are made, where they come from. So I would love to start with that. Um, so if we can think about um, fashion fabrics, so how are they made and from what? So can you try to break it down for us a little bit so we can sort of like get an understanding <laughs> and okay. then what are the small parts, uh, where do they come from? Okay, so uh, materials in general, if we're talking about um, textiles, let's leave leather to one side for the moment. Yes. But if we're talking about textiles made from fibres, uh, it's really helpful to be able to uh, understand the materials impacts through categorising them. So the very first thing that we do is we question where a material's from. So is it grown in the ground? Is it grown on the back of an animal? or from a silk moth, for example. So is it, a, it could be cashmere, it could be wool, that's off the back of an animal, silkworm. Or is it a regenerated fiber? Now, not many people know what that means, but you may have heard of viscose and rayon. So that's what we call a regenerated fiber. So it means that it has been, it's from a natural source, but it's been broken down and remade into a new fiber. So unlike taking it from the sheep or from the ground, which has been, you know, sort of taken direct from natural source. So that's three categories. So there's natural with 
grown fibers in the ground, natural from the back of an animal, and there's regenerated fibers. Then we also have the synthetic group of fibers, which I think we all know really well, your polyesters, nylons, etc. Yeah. And they are all made out of oil, essentially. So a, a non-renewable fossil fuel. And they are they take up the biggest part of global fiber demand. So they're the most recognized. Everybody's got them in their wardrobe. Then we have a newly emerging category of materials, which are um, the biofabricated category. So we're going to see our materials landscape really changing over the next five, 10, 20 years quite radically. We've thus far been reliant on those traditional fibers that we talked about from farming sources. So we've got basically, uh, we've got, if you want to carve it up and you want to talk about what are the better choices? I always say there's no such thing as just one sustainable material. They always say, which is the most sustainable material in the collection? And we have over 5,000 materials. It doesn't work like that. It's more about yeah. the right material for the right purpose. That's one thing. So that, And you're designing with longevity in mind and you're thinking about what happens to that product when it's finished with. So that's an overarching thing. But you could say that for the categories I just mentioned, that essentially you're dividing materials into biosource and sort of technical source, meaning they're made out of they're made, they're made out of petrol, they're made out of oil. So we've got a huge slew of materials that are essentially plastic. That's what they are. So your polyester okay. fleece, your your leggings, they're made out of plastic. <laughs> now the only I mean, everything that we like and the stretchy yeah. bits that's all plastic yes. I'm afraid. Yes. and we know it's very durable and we know it dries really quickly so we've got very addicted to plastic and as we know we all know we've seen the horror films from um you know david attenborough shining a spotlight on the fact that we are addicted to this highly toxic material source so essentially anything that's synthetic is toxic because it can't biodegrade the one good thing is you can keep recycling it for quite a few goes you know so essentially it's about keeping it out of out of keep it out of the biosphere don't bury this stuff because it won't break down don't put it in the ocean recover it and number one is let's just stop using virgin we need to stop using virgin yeah. plastic in every category whether it be your water bottle your straw or your leggings or your fleece <laughs> It, they should always be from a recycled source because, of course, we've got to use what is already there. But we should stop completely making plastic, it, new plastic. It's toxic. And then you've got all the other ones I mentioned, which are from biosources. They can circulate in healthy systems. They can biodegrade, providing you're not loading them with toxic chemicals. So those mm -hmm. materials, if they are responsibly farmed and produced, are a naturally better source but just because it's cotton doesn't mean it's it's sustainable perfect perfect <laughs> note on this so i mean there's so much to um, unpack and and sort of demythify still but yeah these are really important points as you said i think bottom line as you said no virgin resources should be used anymore for materials that's number one and as you said i think that really helps to make it quite clear there are these three categories that we're looking at the natural resources plants or animals regenerated or synthetics from crude oil now it's shocking you mentioned already that around 63 percent of all textiles are made from synthetics roughly right yes yeah. it around, it's around the it's around two-thirds so our our global fiber demand is made up predominantly from that as you say two-thirds is oil-based a quarter is cotton and most of that is conventionally farmed which is also devastating to the environment and humans so we've got unless unless of course it's organic certified organic cotton it's also devastating to the environment you wouldn't think it everybody goes oh it's natural so it's fine yeah. depends very I much think, on i think there's this farmed. misconception yeah, yeah there's this misconception because we now we sort of try to attack the plastics and to say oh this is all bad which it is as you said it's toxic it's not biodegradable uh within our lifetime at least or few anyways and uh uh, but also the problem is with the natural fibers. And I always get shocked because I'm a huge fan of wool. And wool, if it's done obviously well and ethically, it's incredibly sustainable yeah. material. 
but there's only 1% used around the world, which is just shocking. And yeah. I always think about the amount of codes that we see around anyways, and it's still only 1%, it accounts. So I think there is this real problem that we see that we just think, oh, it's cotton, it's automatically good. Yeah. And that's unfortunately not the case. And same, so and same with this. Yeah. Yeah, that, true, true. So, okay, let's look at the cotton then. Because we are seeing a lot of this um, talk around organic cotton. And I, I, I believe that a lot of people think that we just replace everything with organic cotton and everything will be great. That's also not the case, right? What is the difference between conventional cotton and organic cotton? And would it save everything if we replace all <laughs> cotton with organic? Well, uh, the, then there's the other question about quantity, but we can come on to that. But if we're just going to zero into yeah. what the impacts are on a particular fibre. So, you know, for example, you know, cotton is, is very well documented that it's a super thirsty uh, pesticide and fertiliser intensive plant. The reason for this is because it's been um, been farmed, uh, you know, over decades and decades to be intensively farmed to increase yield. So that is being bec meant becoming reliant upon these pesticides and uh, you know, chemical fertilizers that actually suck the soil dry of nutrients. So you're basically, um, you're basically lowering the agricultural landscape's ability to sequester CO2, which then feeds into our climate change problem. So if we had huge swathes of agricultural land that is not able to operate in the normal carbon cycle that it should do, which keeps everything in balance, we've disrupted the balance through you know, yeah. our, our, um, our activities. Um, and then the, the place of agricultural land in being able to sequester CO2 is super, super important. And this is part of the reason that, that cotton is so bad. So it's so thirsty, it takes up way, way, way too, too much water. And of course, what's happened over time is in order to try to breed cotton that is pesticide uh, resistant, we've turned to GM seed. So now we have farmers trapped in a cycle of having to buy genetically modified seed and they can't propagate their own seed. They have to buy it at a highly inflated pr price from the producers of the seed. And you just get trapped in this cycle then and it becomes also pesticide resistant. It was bred to, to not to be prey to pesticides and it's actually become pesticide resistant. Be resistant. You, yeah. Yeah. you have this horrible cycle. So any cotton that is conventionally farmed is, is very, very damaging. I mean, you know, we're now seeing people are waking up to the fact that cotton is a critical fiber for us to improve through through those uh, uh, ecological impacts that I spoke about, but also, um, you know, the, the social impacts as well, which have been manifest because, you know, farmers uh, health, die, you know, and, and farmers committing mm. suicide because they're beholden to, you know, they're in debt because of buying seeds. So at least all of the ramifications are really huge with cotton. So in answer to your question about the, the difference there, it's, it's about yeah. basically promoting um, materials, whether it be wool or whether it be cotton, that are part of organic regenerative systems, because we've done so much damage to land and the biosphere in general. If you've been watching David Attenborough, you'll know that as well, yes. through our industrial exactly. activities that we need to repair. So it's not just good enough to limit damage. And I think the message can be dangerous around oh we can just recycle our way out of this problem mm. recycling has a place it's good yeah um but it will it doesn't mean carry on as normal but just recycle everything it means really looking fundamentally at the systems that need to be repaired and in the case of cotton or in wool farming or cashmere farming you know we've heard about the devastation also of intensively farming cashmere it's about regenerating yeah the land so that it can go about its biogeochemical cycles as usual and we don't get into this situation that we're in now with a climate emergency yeah. the, these all of these we things need to ra radically is, change the system yeah, yeah. over and what, to what organic about hemp? and regen what about so hemp? He well what hemp is, is hemp is a you know is a, a far more environmentally positive fiber to grow than cotton but you know it was uh, outlawed in the in the US because it's oh it's a relative of cannabis so they think oh it's a really bad plant but it's not exactly the same strain so 
actually what Donald Trump did in 2018, probably the only good thing he's ever done, is actually signed a farm bill that allowed um, hemp to be grown in the US because for the longest time okay. it was is illegal so anyway okay. hemp is in answer to your question very good to know. <laughs> yeah i yeah. mean one one good thing right so we'll be seeing yeah. i think a resurgence of that particular fiber being used more creatively kind of help us ease our reliance on cotton um yeah. and it is more positive for the environment and it doesn't really it doesn't really okay. require pesticides and fertilizers in the same way and it, and it provides nutrients back to the soil so it's a very environmentally <laughs> positive plant yeah so we need yeah. to look out for alternatives to cotton and yeah, in order yeah. to change the, the, yeah, the, exactly. the situation. Yeah. Really. Great. Thank you. That's, um, mm -hmm. that's already um, much clearer in terms of the, just to understand the connection, how it goes all the way back to farmers and the land, the soil, it affects so many people. And I think, you know, the average person doesn't always think about it when they are in the shop and buying a t-shirt that is cheap, you know, and that, that there is this consequence and an impact. Um, the next category then, uh, just so we can get through some of them, because so much to talk about, of course, such a little time. But what about the regenerative materials that you mentioned, or fibers rather, um, that we see in our fashion materials? Can you tell us a bit more about viscose? Because they, there's a lot of talk and buzzwords as such yeah. as biodegradable and compostable. And uh, there is always this difficulty for a lot of people to understand viscose and tensile and other uh, um, trademark materials. So let's touch up on that if we can, please. Okay, so, so viscose ray or rayon, as it, you might uh, sometimes see it called as well, was um, actually invented in the latter part of the 19th century. So it's been around a very, very long time. What most people don't realize is the feedstock that makes that lovely drapey fa fabric that we love is actually trees, usually. Um, we do get some bamboo viscose as well, but it's essentially cellulose taken from trees. There's a lot of uh, material innovation going on right now to think about other feedstocks. However, traditionally, uh, it's either beech, eucalyptus, those types of, uh, of trees. So it can be uh, either it can be a very sustainable material or it can be a really catastrophically bad material to produce. So you're cutting mm -hmm. down trees. If you are cutting those trees down and they are not from certified forests, that's clearly really bad. So that's your first point. You know, we always speak about at the sustainable angle provenance and processing and post-life. So we think about what are the impacts of each particular fabric as regards to those, uh, those areas. So yes, so you can imagine if you're cutting down swathes of trees and that's not certified, that's really bad. Then the processing is highly complex. You need some really strong chemicals to break wood cellulose down into something that's usable to extrude uh, it, you know, make a liquid cellulose to extrude it into a fiber. And if you are not managing those uh, chemicals well, i.e. Um, obviously in the lyocell process, we're seeing that I think a lot of consumers will recognize that lyocell process means it's a closed loop process where it's capturing and recovering all of those chemicals and the water as well and just reusing it. If you're putting all of that stuff out into the environment, it's highly toxic. So it utterly depends on your supplier. It utterly mm -hmm. depends on your certification of your wood feedstock. And it utterly depends on your processing. So assured processing. So unless it's Lyocell or particular, you'll see brand names like Tencel, for example, um, which have the registered trademark, that is a closed loop. That's a Lyocell process. So you can then think about if you want to buy that beautiful drape drapey material that you are looking very specifically, that it has an FSC or PEFC certification and that it's Lyocell processed as well. So, okay. Okay. yeah. That, that helps because I think, um, yeah, a lot of people still are so confused about the names. And of course, if you don't understand and not in the know uh, what is going on in terms of the process, it's very hard to know what is the right choice. But yeah, this, this really helps. So we're looking for certifications, especially where the trees come from yeah. and they should be from sustainably sourced forests. In the first place, um, there's Canopy, the international organization that is helping suppliers. That's and correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, I just want to point out that something that I get very frustrated that it's amazing to see these incredible fibers that are done well, as you said, with the right certifications. Uh, a lot of these trademarked um, viscose fibers are biodegradable and compostable um, as a fiber. But 
it doesn't always stay like that because then it's turned into materials and into textiles that have a lot of processes added to them. And this is where the confusion can happen as well, that what is actually still biodegradable or compostable well as a yes the, exactly the whole biodegradable thing is everybody goes oh it's natural so it's biodegradable well it's mm. it's biodegradable it doesn't mean that's going to happen to it that's the thing when we were doing our research around um recycling and biodegradability is the problem is is that we don't have the systems in place to man to, to get that material through that system usually unless those networks have been built, built up so i think there's great opportunity in systems design and collaborations in joining dots up between various organizations uh because it's all very easy to just put something out into the world and go oh it's fine because it's biodegradable but yet, yet there's no system in place to make that happen and also there's a lot of research going on in universities that um you know some of the uh, biopolymers for example that are being developed with a will to be more sustainable um they've actually discovered uh, i think it was university of plymouth that you're putting a biopolymer plastic bag into the ocean and it will survive in the ocean for a good three six months and it can still hold shopping when you fish it out so actually it's the circumstances under which mm. you're making it biodegradable. Is it biodegradable in your own back garden or do you need to take yeah. it to an industrial composting facility? Uh, yeah. As you say, if it contains toxic chemicals, um, do those have to be in some way removed before it can be placed in an industrial composting facility? So the whole area of, of, of oh, you know, oh, it's going to return to the earth safely really needs i mean there's a lot of research going on right now but really needs to, to to be looked at what level of moisture what level of heat what level of whatever where have i got to put I it, think, it yeah this is, i think this is specifically the problem with uh viscose and natural fibers that we just assume that they can come back to soil but there's this amount of chemicals that are part of the process that are so invisible and so unknown, yeah. not just to consumers, but also to everybody in, in the fashion industry. It's still such an untraceable aspect of fashion that this is the problem that it stops us from doing proper recycling. And then we have a lot of obviously startups and companies looking into this. And of course, one of the biggest problems we have, it's the blends, of course, and uh, the blended materials, but, um, how do you see that as a, as a, as a, you know, this was something that's been developed uh, 20 plus years ago when we you know synthetics were um, uh, exciting and suddenly became super cheap. So blending fibers was um, exciting because you can sort of create um, new characteristics for uh, specific materials. It was more affordable but it's creating all these issues because they're not really recyclable, right? That's true. Yes, it's always historically been a really big problem. And, you know, we do this. I and mean, if we talk about recycling, you know, there's a long history of recycling wool, as you know, in Prato, uh, make beautiful recycled wools. Yes. But very often, if you are mechanically shredding a material down, whether that be a cotton or a wool, you're shortening the fiber. So what happens then is that they think, oh, to strengthen the fiber, you usually will put in a little polyamide or something like that in the spinning to to strengthen mm -hmm. it enable you to knit and weave with it so we've got a long history of this if you look in your wardrobe you'll see everybody's got little smatterings of synthetic in whatever they think is primarily a natural fiber so yeah. but um previously it's always been impossible you're correct but we're, we're right on the cusp of seeing these new technologies emerge that are actually capable of separating uh, polyesters from cotton so that's usually yeah. that's the big hit because we always see if you if you have anything gray marl in your wardrobe it's usually got, you know, whatever it is, 78% cotton and the rest is a polyester or a polyamide to give it that mild effect, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So we know there's bucket loads of it around. Um, and I think that, you know, these new technologies we're seeing like Worn Again, um, you know, New Cycle by Evernew, yeah. they are going to be coming. Yeah. yeah, exactly. There's a whole load of them that are all yeah. on this technology of separation, whether it be by depolymerization and forming new liquid uh, fibers that can be re-extruded. Uh, so there's really so there's some very, very cool technologies coming out and they're literally right on the cusp of being commercially available. So these are yeah. solutions that are really exciting. Mm -hmm. 
it means that you know we can continue to to gain new fibers out of old and so hopefully that stops us generating so much in the way of virgin materials and then just landfilling them when you think about you know reverso for example that i'm sure you're familiar with this is um you know the technology that uh, re-engineers wool and cashmere to a very very high spec in fact stella mccartney's yeah. using it um, it, it makes an incredible impact because, you know, cashmere is I think, about 100 times more impactful than producing wool alone. You know, and wool's pretty impactful in its own way. So to be able to take the value, this super expensive, beautiful value mm -hmm. of fibre and give it extra lives is is really positive. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I mean, there are always challenges as um, we have recycled wool here as well. They are making some comments that there's still, you know, challenge even just recycling wool, which we yeah. think it's not as difficult as other complex fibers and materials. But OK, and now we talk about recycling. Uh, what about the recycling of synthetics? Uh, we are getting excited about this in the industry. Everybody's sort of replacing, you know, the active wear materials with the recycled poly. Uh, polyester and recycled nylon how do we see this is this better option is this more sustainable what about the microfibers that we keep hearing that are shedding from the materials where are we with this yeah i mean it's well obviously i think we said in the beginning it's it's better to to uh recycle these particular this particular material category we just got to stop producing virgin virgin plastics um in this regard um you know but you're you're quite right actually what it does do is make everybody think oh well i can carry on using the material because i've recycled it so we're still kind of mm -hmm. stuck in this thing where we're you know we have become addicted to it because it's convenient it's easy wear it's cheaper um you know for all of these reasons i mean you're right about the microfibers as well that's a whole other conversation and there's research still mm -hmm. ongoing on that we know that all, all um, materials shed microfibers. We just don't know. I mean, they've been doing counts, fiber counts in various different parts of the world about um, exactly how many microfibers per liter of water, uh, for example, if it's in the rivers or even in the Arctic. I mean, it's scary, but it, and also it's in the atmosphere as well. So we are literally yeah. surrounded by plastic particles. I don't know what the answer is, to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, I know brands are pushing fiber catching bags when you're laundering and stuff like that. That captures, I guess, but it don't, doesn't make the problem go away. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know. We need to decouple. We need to decouple from a fossil fuel based economy. That's what's at the heart of it. So it isn't yeah. just about, oh, the oil's in the fabric. It's the oil runs everything about our world and if we are to um you know kind of avert catastrophic climate change we do and this has been spoken about for decades and decades actually yeah. really start to develop a bio economy we should have we you know we should have done this and actually no more oil leave leave the oil in the ground in fact there's research organizations that say we need to leave at least between 60 to 80 percent of what's already still in the ground just leave it there because it's wow. you know so damaging for us to use as an energy yes. source and a material yes. source that it's you know it's off the it's off the scale we just need to stop with that material full stop so, so this is a really good point so okay so this um, kind of helps pos uh, possibly designers to really think about their fabric choices so if i can ask you to give some tips for designers who are sourcing fabrics and they want to choose better fabrics because as we said at the beginning there is no such single fabric that it's the most sustainable no. it just doesn't work like that um how what, what would be your practical tip um uh, for them to find the best possible options uh, after everything that we talked about yeah. and the impact of materials well i think with the sort of strong message we've come across is wherever you can avoid virgin materials because then you lower your impact straight away in whatever fiber category so that's that's a really positive thing you can do you know we've worked with designers um uh, sustainable angles such as uh, Patrick Medal, you know, who's doesn't touch a, a you know a new fabric. It's all it's all dead stock. I mean, you know, they do say one strap line when you're talking about consumer behaviour is oh the most sustainable thing is already in your wardrobe, you know. Um, and so we're talking about maybe sharing economy and stuff like that. That's a whole other conversation. But reuse, creative reuse of 
material sources that's a that's an easy easy win why always go to the to the new if you are going to the new because you need very specific properties and you know that you're designing for longevity um and you're designing for uh, understanding what happens when the garment is no longer used and you're thinking about mm -hmm. that then i think it's about creating your own set it depends what you're designing and what you're making it's about creating your own set of parameters about what makes sense under the terms that i spoke about really knowing the provenance of your material what it takes to make it what it takes to process it how it mm -hmm. might return to the earth and then you can go well, I'm really not happy with synthetics, even if they are recycled. I'm going to look for, you know, completely reclaimed. I'm never going to use a new material again. Or I'm only, you can do a lot of power by sourcing your materials that you know have been created from regenerative farming practices because you're, you're actually responsible for um, then building that practice which very desperately needs to be built if we are to regenerate our um you know decimated landscapes and also restore biodiversity so that's a critical choice is buying materials that support those practices yeah okay. so i think Amazing. does that answer the question uh, so <laughs> Um, I think they they should come to you first of all. <laughs> oh yeah, this and is, please this come is the to the message. Future Fabrics Expo. We just actually sign up to our, um, our our website for our newsletters. We just released a newsletter. We're hoping to have and it, fingers crossed in real life expo yes. in spring we normally hold it in january but the things being the way they are we hope it's possible in spring but we will carry on working doing what we do so please sign up and obviously follow us on on instagram as well um and so you'll get updates mm -hmm. that way um and do come and you know if you are a brand or your designer or whatever think about coming and uh, sourcing from us because we can help point you in the right direction in all different fiber categories Amazing. And one last question. I, mean, yeah. I just saw a little question uh, from somebody uh, who is watching, which is lovely. Um, there was a question about Elastan. And of course, that's a complex question. What do we think about it? And yeah. we, we don't have the time to dive in. But I just want to say, speaking of new exciting materials, I just heard from our common friend a couple of days ago that they just developed the first bio-based Elastan. It's super Top, a super uh, secret still, but they just signed the paperwork. It's the first ever bio a base Elliston. So there are uh, there are new things coming up, and science is amazing in terms of finding new solutions for these difficult materials. And that just leads me to um, your uh, exciting materials that you love for future. There are any upcoming materials that you've seen or processes that have been super exciting to see. Can you share some tips with us or tips like ideas around materials that we yeah. probably never even heard of? Well, yes, just to sort of sign off, obviously a big part of what we do is we provide solutions commercially but also spotlight as you know you've been to the expo the up-and-coming innovations that are ones that um you know we think in a few years time once there's investment and scalability can represent um you know uh, point the way to a new materials landscape so one that is bio-based uh one that is um you know can safely return to that cycle uh, and yes. also that has a positive income impact. So, you know, sustainability talk used to always be about lowering your impact and what can you do to limit things. Now the conversation has really turned much more to the word regenerative, renew, regenerative, you know, restore. So what can we do from a materials perspective that will do that? So this is about the big buzzwords about restoring biodiversity, restoring agricultural land, you know, um, sequestering CO2. That's a big thing. So on that note, one of my favourite sort of material uh, areas that a lot of people are, are looking into is uh, seaweed. So algae forms, because yes. seaweed, of course, sequesters CO2 even way better than trees. So if you are looking at that as a material source, so in other words, possibly to make a biopolymer, so um, I will actually be speaking um, at the, uh, the Plastic Free World Conference with a designer called Charlotte McCurdy. And uh, she is absolutely fascinating. We featured her, her biopolymer, algae-based biopolymer, and all the science on how this material, as you wear it, can actually sequester CO2 is really fascinating. Wow. So those are the things, those are the dream ideas that actually are not such a dream they're not that far away there's a lot mm -hmm. of work being done with this as a sustainable source because it can be grown 
um, and harvested sustainably. Um, so, you know, if we're running out of agricultural land, we need that for yes. food. We shouldn't be growing yeah. so many textiles. We should be looking at other sources. So, so I love that. There's a lot of work also in biofabrication around mushrooms. So mycelium roots specifically. And yes. there's going to be, you're going to see coming commercially first very slowly because they've just done collaborations with designers like Stella McCartney, but um, yeah. mycelium leather. So yeah. as you know, there are huge concerns around the leather industry. So materials like that, that are very much, they almost seem wild and wacky but actually they're rooted in an idea of of our relationship with the natural world and how we use materials so those are the things that um get me amazing. excited <laughs> amazing i mean that really brings us back to nature and where it all starts and we need to yeah. we need to be inspired by nature and how things are made there so my mycelium is a perfect example of that so yes thank you so much i mean there's You're so, so much welcome. to um say of course <laughs> and there's so much to see but um i definitely would point everybody and we will do a post dedicated to you and your uh, virtual oh, expo you. as well because because you are the people who have been really vetting and checking materials for years and years and years now. And as a non-for-profit organization, I believe that that kind of gives us the most objective point of view as well on materials and the whole spectrum. So thank you for sharing your thoughts and oh, your knowledge. you're so thank welcome. You, I'm sorry it took us so long to connect, but it's so great to see you. And I'm loving oh. seeing everybody. Thank you, everybody. Yes, for lots, this a lot night. of love from everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so nice. Thanks so much. Yes. And do do keep an eye out for, we're always trying to post information about what we're up to. So yeah, do we'll follow share. us. Thank yeah. you so much again. Thanks. Take care. Have a good Thank day. Bye. 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 Bye.